guests, um, members of our team. Welcome to this really thrilling, exciting afternoon. Um, before we start this journey discussing 20 years of the Shivnada Foundation and releasing of our annual report, um, I'd just like to talk a bit about the panel. So in a country such as ours where thousands of trusts exist, it's important for a foundation such as ours, whereas many other foundations and trusts within the philanthropy arena to really follow governance, standards, accountability, responsibility very closely. So we thought that first we should discuss philanthropy, governance, roles, just in general in India as it exists today. So um, I'd like to just um, introduce our illustrious uh, panelists. The moderator is Subhashish, Dr. Subhashish Gangopadhyay. He's the director of the School of Humanities and Social Sciences at the Shivnada University. He's, um, he's also the research director of the India Development Foundation. Um, we have Rohit Bahadur with us. He's the partner, uh, business risk services and not-for-profit for, for uh, Grant Thornton. He's a chartered accountant and a certified public accountant, having 20 years of experience in advising clients on audit, grant audits, internal audit, enterprise risk management, developing standard operating procedures, and governance advisory. We've got Nazneen Karmali here. She's the India ed editor of Forbes Asia um, and the Mumbai bureau manager. She was previously the managing editor of Business India. She's also the founding director of Satya Gyan Foundation, a nonprofit organization that aims to alleviate poverty through education and employment. Um, Ashish Dhawan, he's the founder and CEO of Central Square Foundation. He worked for 20 years in the investment management business and ran one of India's leading private equity funds, Chris Capital. In 2012, he decided um, it was time to move to philanthropy and uh, he launched the Central Square Foundation. We also have Ono Ru. He's the country director of the World Bank of India. A Dutch national, he was previously the director of operation services and quality in South Asia region of the World Bank. Ru joined the bank in 1993 as a country officer for Moldova and Armenia. Prior to working in the bank, Ru was the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Netherlands. We also have someone from the government. We have uh, ex T.S. Krishnamurti, started his career as an Indian Revenue Services Officer. He served the government at various levels, including as Secretary, Department of Company Affairs. He was the first Indian Revenue Service Officer to become Secretary to the Government of India, as well as the Chief Election Commissioner of India. Um, so without f wasting any more time, this is our panelist, and I now turn it over to Subhashish. Thanks. First, let me welcome you all to the, this 20 years celebration of Shiv Nadar Foundation. We're going to have a panel discussion, and we will have to stop at 5.30. And I'm sure that with your cooperation and the panelists, we should be able to do that, and yet come away a little bit more knowledgeable than what we are right now, yes? Um, what we are going to do is we are going to follow strictly the alphabetical order. So we'll start with Rohit. And um, the question I have for you, what I will do is um, the panelists have promised that they're going to keep their um, you know, interjections extremely short. And they're going to also speak for a very short time, right? <laughs> and, and I'm going to moderate that. That's my only job, to make sure that everybody keeps time. So Rohit is going to, you, you are going to talk about, um, you know, in your experience, right, what you see are the trends that uh, philanthropic organizations outside of India, notably in the US and UK, are doing. Sure. Um, thanks so much, Subhashish. And, uh, uh, you know, thanks uh, to the Shivnadar uh, Foundation family for, uh, you know, inviting me as one of the panelists. Uh, uh, Subhashish has been, you know, uh, uh, threatening all of us to keep our, uh, uh, you know, initial uh, uh, talk short, so I'll, I'll try and keep it as short as possible. Uh, I'm, I'm going to speak uh, not out of my own experience, but I would like to actually touch upon certain key trends uh, which have been highlighted in uh, 
uh, studies which have been done by uh, our Gron Thornton uh, specialists in the US and the UK. Uh, so uh, the first uh, trend uh, is as per the 2012 National Board Governance Survey for not-for-profit organizations uh, run by uh, our Grant Thornton office in the US. Uh, this actually pertains to uh, basically the not-for-profit boards. And it's very surprising that uh, you know, this survey comes out with a finding that even in the US, uh, there are only 38% of the boards which are actually engaged with the issues in hand. And uh, another surprising uh, statistic which is actually thrown open by uh, this survey is that only 14% of the boards, even in the US, are, have been rated as very effective. So now the, you know, contextualizing it, uh, you know, in the Indian context, what should we actually do uh, to make not-for-profit boards in India more effective, uh, you know, is the question that I'm actually putting on the table. Uh, the second trend, uh, you know, which uh, is again, uh, has been thrown out by the same uh, uh, survey, is really that of reputational risk uh, management. So increasingly, uh, charities in the US are facing the issue of protecting reputational risk because they are under greater public and private scrutiny. Uh, one of the ways in which they are actually mitigating this reputation risk is by, by tracking and disclosing a very interesting uh, uh, financial ratio. And that is the overhead and functional expense allocation over programming administration and fundraising. And I very strongly believe that this is a key matrix which uh, you know, all not-for-profits in India should, should also use. For, because if there is any cost reduction exercise within the organization, this ratio actually reflects it. And in addition to this, it has been proven over and over again uh, that organizations which have a low head overhead on their programs or a higher program ratio are in a better position to actually attract uh, more uh, funding. And uh, very quickly, uh, the last trend which I would like to touch upon is again uh, uh, a statistic which has been thrown uh, open uh, by uh, uh, our UK practice through the Charity Governance Review uh, 2013, which was actually an analysis of the top 100 charities in the UK. And uh, this is a positive trend. 77% uh, of the charities actually disclosed in their annual report against their aims and objectives. Uh, also, uh, another trend was that 25% of these top 100 charities actually published impact reports. And they had a separate section on their website where they actually placed these uh, impact reports. And in India, uh, I also encourage uh, you know, organizations like the Shiv Nadar Foundation. And I'm, uh, you know, I am of a very firm believer that at least the top 50 or 100 charities should publish annual reports as these are uh, a great tool to demonstrate to the public, uh, you know, uh, on the transparency, on your culture, and, and it's really a great tool to actually communicate. And I would encourage uh, at least the top 50 or 100 charities to, to, to go ahead and publish annual reports, uh, even though uh, you know, it is a largely uh, unregulated sector. Thank you, Rohit. Ashish, I want to now go to you. He said that uh, most philanthropic organizations right, should be transparent. Now, I can understand you should be transparent to the donors. But if you're not taking outside funding, why would a charitable organization need to be transparent? Transparent to whom? Sure. So I think the transparency isn't just to the donors, because you're dealing with a larger public. I mean, we're, as foundations, we're playing a role uh, in civil society. And so I think there's an obligation to society to be transparent with regards to not just financial data, but a whole variety of different things. So I think the transparency starts with being explicit about what one's mission is, what one's goals are, so that it's very clear to everyone as to what this foundation stands for. Some foundations have an ideological bent. I think one needs to be explicit about that because that does feed itself 
into the work. Um, I think it's important to be quite explicit about you know, the, the, how you measure what you do. Um, I think that's one trend we're seeing with a lot of foundations globally is a lot of focus on measurement and evaluation and being, uh, sharing those results with the broader public. Um, I think there's a commitment to, there's a, as a foundation, whatever work you're doing is anyway going to be siloed and will be sort of very small relative to what the government is doing and relative to the system. And so I think there's almost an obligation to share your learnings with others as a result of that. And so a commitment also to be transparent about all learnings, all insights that you have from the work that you're doing. Uh, because it then would lead to hopefully change either at the policy level or other foundations being able to learn from that and vice versa, you learning from others. So I think the obligation is not just to donors, but to government, to society, uh, all stakeholders. So, so you're asking uh, people and organizations to be good? I think just to be, I mean, not just be good, obviously all of us are trying to do good, but to be fairly open. Um, which means you'll invite some degree of criticism. But I think to be, res I mean, these are all respectful relationships. I may be a grantor and somebody else may be a grantee. That doesn't mean I have rights to all their information and they have no right to in any information on what I'm up to or what my eventual goals are. So I think it's the idea of building respectful relationships and thinking about this more broadly. At the end of the day, we want systemic change, all of us, not just change with in the work that we're doing. And so therefore, it places a higher obligation, even in organizations that have a sole donor. So I'll now go to Nazneen. See, you're, you're a person who looks at such organizations, rates them probably, writes about them, meet them, right? And as a journalist, you write for the people, right? Now, he's saying that it's important that you get all the information to be able to give to the people. Right? So what would you say to that? Well, uh, you know, Forbes is all about billionaires and uh, so rather than non-profits we look at uh, individuals who are doing philanthropy you know people like Shiv and his family uh, and what my experience has been is that you know um, whilst we are known for our billionaires list we do publish another list called our heroes of philanthropy which doesn't get as much uh, airtime as the billionaires list does. But increasingly, uh, you know, this is becoming important. What we do is we collect, we, uh, we do a, a annual sort of exercise where we take 40 people from Asia, from 10 countries. So we really need four people from each country. And I find that, you know, uh, getting information is not that easy. Um, it's, it's easier getting information on wealth than on philanthropy. And uh, basically, if you just look at the top 500 wealthy people in the country, it's not very apparent, uh, you know, what they're doing quite transparently in the area of philanthropy. There's, a, <coughs> there's an information gap there. So we do, uh, you know, at least I find that, you know, honing in on these heroes uh, takes a lot more effort uh, than uh, I would have imagined. So you want the, the heroes first. to be more open? Yes, indeed, indeed, uh, uh, more disclosures. But you know, there's another side. The flip side is that they, you know, they feel that they don't want to talk about it. Uh, they don't want to talk about the philanthropy. They want to keep it quiet. Um, but my argument to them is that you know, we philanthropy today in India. I mean, the way you know, where we are economically, socially, I think it's really important that we do have role models. And so my argument to uh, people who tend to be secretive is that, uh, you know, almost you've got an obligation to be a role model for others. Because if you look at it, uh, uh, you know, the kind of wealth that's being created, there's no commensurate, um, you know, it's not being seen as responsible wealth, that you're giving back enough uh, from what you're getting. So and there is a huge argument for being more open right now. Uh, you know, this morning I was, uh, uh, you know, on this flight to Delhi and I met a senior executive from a very, very large company who's on the verge of retirement and I just casually asked him, I said, you know, uh, what are your views on philanthropy now that you're, 
you know, going to be stepping down. And he said, you know, one line, I don't give to any nonprofit because I don't know what the heck they're going to do with my money. So, um, so I think one side is this uh, secrecy. The other side is, uh, you know, there's, there's a public distrust uh, of non-profits which has come up. So um, there I will go to, the, to Mr. Krishnamurti who has been a taxman and has been the chief election commissioner where every political leader has a charitable organization. So uh, well, they're obliged to disclose to you, right? To a limited extent, yes. <laughs> uh, let, me, let me first uh, commence uh, um, by saying that uh, I would like to compliment Mr. Shiv Nadar and his foundation for organizing this um, panel discussion because at a time in India where probably all the electronic and print media is taking too much of time on politics and sports, I think there is very little time for them for philanthropy. So I'm glad that this panel discussion takes place. I think it's a... So you're disparaging the two most important entertainments I'm not disparaging. In I'm, give, I'm saying that there must be more equal weight for this particular sector. Well, traditionally, Indian businessmen have had charitable disposition. As you know, even when they open their accounts for somebody, the first sentence is about for charity. They allocate a certain percentage. But then with the globalization and commercialization of business in a large scale, I think charity seems to be a little um, difficult sector for most of the modern businessmen. I feel at the same time there is too much of crowding and clouding in the charity sector. There are many people who are doing silently, as she said, and there are many people who are doing very openly. But the point is that there is very little uh, you know, self-regulation. Uh, there is no certification of, uh, of uh, charitable institutions. In some states, we have charity commissioner, as in Bombay, but in other places, there is no such equivalent position. So you go to the registrar of societies or registrar of trusts, and if you have a complaint, you go to them or go to the high court, and the criminal and the legal procedure seem to be too complicated. So my uh, observation is that, well, India has reason to be proud about its charitable disposition, but it is not well organized. It needs to be organized properly must be a proper accounting standard for most of the charitable institutions. There must, they don't want a regulation from the government, but I can certainly say there must be an independent certification board to indicate which institutions are doing well, which are not doing well. And then under the right to information, now most of the charitable institutions can, we cannot ask information because only public institutions are um, subject to uh, right to information. We should consider, because when so much of donation is being given by public, by stakeholders, I, I, I'm a strong voter, even political parties should come under the right to information. So all charitable institutions should have some kind of a, a method by which the information is made but available. Yes, if I could interrupt you there, you said that you need self-regulation. Now charitable organizations get tax breaks. Yeah. So why is it self-regulation? Why can't it be more, uh, you know, Obligatory disclosure. Well, obligatory <coughs> disclosures may prevent some people from coming into the charity sector. If you too much of restrictions or too much of regulations. So my own uh, thing is, as far as possible, minimum regulations from the government side for tax purposes. But otherwise, it's uh, better to give a, a self-regulation or a certification board to get into this. The last point I want to make is about grievances. There are a number of uh, stakeholders, public particularly, they have some grievances about these charitable institutions. There should be a, a, a corner in the website or whatever it is for inviting the grievances against the charitable institutions so that you can provide more transparency and accountability in this area. I think uh, that's uh, Thank the you. initial <laughs> remarks. So, no, you're, you have been an economist, right? And you know, economists are uh, extremely cut and dried people, right? They believe that everything has to be rational. So the New York Stock Exchange was set up by the you know, um, investors who wanted to get away from the so-called robber barons, mm. right? And improve their image and get you know, investment in. So do you think we need something like that also in uh, these uh, philanthropic organizations who should set themselves apart from you know, whatever he was trying to, he was not saying, but he was hinting at? 
I, I don't know. I'm, I mean, very few people would have described me as somebody who just tries to promote rationality, but that's okay. Oops. Um, uh, so first of all, uh, I think it's great we're having this discussion. I think Shiv Nader Foundation is really visionary in talking about this topic. I come from the Netherlands. In the Netherlands, we disparage philanthropy as something that only is necessary in countries where government doesn't take care of social programs. Then I moved to the United States where people think the exact opposite. And, and I actually have to say that my own perspective shifted a little bit through that move because I, I saw some of the advantages of my own system and I saw some of the advantages of, of, of a very different outlook. So, so I'm a bit more balanced. Um, the Dutch at one time were the highest spenders on aid yes, but on, per capita. But, but aid is not philanthropy. Uh, I'm talking about corporate and individual philanthropy. Okay. I'm not talking about aid. Uh, we're still very high spenders. But I don't want to talk about aid because that, that, that's boring and that's not the topic of today's conversation. Um, to me, the question is, uh, what is the need for accountability and what do phil philanthropic organizations actually do? And I'd like to share some of my, my, my own experience. I was in Nigeria, and Nigeria is one of the last countries that has polio. It shares this, unfortunately, with India and Pakistan. Although India, I think, had a very good year this year. But it's, uh, these countries are on the verge of eliminating polio. So one philanthropic organization, uh, that is uh, the other one than the Lions, if you know which one I'm talking about, the Rotarians, pushed this very hard. And it's a great thing. They want to eliminate po polio from the world. So what did they do? They went to northern Nigeria and pushed mothers to understand that they should vaccinate their kids against polio because that way they could save their lives. The mothers initially believed them and went and vaccinated their kids against polio, but the slight problem was it wasn't coordinated with the general vaccination program. So they didn't get vitamin A, nor did they get the DTP. So many of the kids died because kids actually rarely die of polio. They mostly die of malaria, tetanus, um, um, uh, diarrhea, things like that. So the mothers believe vaccination is not effective and didn't come back for the DTP and the vitamin A. It's a horrible story, and I'm, I apologize for telling a horrible story. But it shows that when you influence public policy, you should be accountable because you, you actually influence the outcomes. And in this case, it seemed like a very positive thing, but it had a very negative outcome. So Gates, they say we want to eliminate disease by promoting uh, vaccines. We all believe vaccines are what will cure everything, right? It's a wonderful thing to believe. You just go, you get your shot, you're done. So AIDS will be that way, maybe cancer will be that way. We already know that cancer won't be that way uh, because it's far too complex. I'm not a doctor, so don't ask me any further details. Now, I'm not saying Gates is doing a bad thing. I'm saying they cannot not be accountable for what they're doing because with the amounts of money that they use in Africa, they could actually buy some of the countries. They couldn't do that in India. Um, uh, but, but still, even in India, they can be a powerful voice for influence and, and influence public policy. Now, I don't personally think that anyone who influences public policy should not be accountable, should not be transparent, should not be subject to, to, to things like right for in, to information. I actually think 10 years from now, people think of Gage just like they think of the World Bank now. Big, influential, some like it, some don't. In the case of the World Bank, most don't like it. As Gates, most like it. That's all fine. But, but they'll realize that there's a need for a real dialogue as to whether good intentions are enough to be allowed to play in the public policy space without accountability and grievance, which is a very important point Mr. Krishnamurti made. I don't have the answer to the question, but it's, it, I really would like to commend the organizers of the debate for bringing this into the debate. And I, deliberately took a fairly extreme view. Don't think I don't like Rotary or I don't like Gates. That's not my point. My point is, they'll be much more like the World Bank than you realize today. Thank you. I, I think I'll, uh, you, know, you said something about uh, assessing the impact of these policies. I presume that's you, what you're also referring to, right? I think that's the most important yeah. thing. I mean, yeah. they also should get audited, of course. Uh, but, but that's, uh, yeah, anybody, but anybody should get audited. Uh, Especially if they're getting tax breaks, right? Uh, absolutely. <laughs> uh, you made a very good point there, actually. Uh, but um, so, 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 you know, you, you are running an organization, right? So the, how do you uh, go about uh, assessing the impact of what you're doing? It's difficult. And making it public. Yeah? It's difficult. I mean, I, we are just starting, but we've spent a lot of time thinking about this. I don't want to go to the extreme. There are some like the Robin Hood Foundation in New York, which will quantify things in dollar terms. I put a dollar in and I get, because they've attached a value to everything, an additional year of schooling, extra year of life, all of that. I think that's, 
It's too many assumptions. It's garbage in, garbage out almost. But I think what anything you do, like say if we're running right now a pilot in North and East Delhi to build school management committees, right? So there has to be some baseline around what is student attendance, what is teacher attendance in those schools, what's parent participation. That needs to be measured. And then a year down the road, two years down the road, after the pilot program has been conducted, we clearly will measure again, and we'll be measuring along the way to see what impact it's had. We may not be able to measure learning outcome in every case, because in India's situation, we're not measuring learning outcome. So we can't compare it you know, versus a control group. But we at least make an attempt in the design of the pilot right up front to define what the baseline is. And to the extent we can get a control group, to get a control group as well, so that we eventually have data. It takes time before you can get the results, because these are not things you measure on a quarterly basis. But these are things you measure over the course of a year, two years, three years. And I think once they are available, it behooves upon us to share it and contribute towards the body of work. There are already several studies that have been done around school management committees. And then invite third parties as well. If a, you know, JPAL wants to come and evaluate the program or somebody else wants to come and evaluate the program, they can do so. Now that, that's a very good point because just as the auditor needs to be a third party, right? Because one of the important things that they talk about in philanthropic organizations that it should not be self-accounting. It should be done by a third party. Similarly, the impact assessment and... But I, I think initially when you're starting something, you may not want to invite a third party because you're figuring it out as you go along. You're learning a lot. And so maybe the first... And you do it on your own, but then you invite others to come and scrutinize it and maybe do it thereafter. So, so Bush, yes, please. I just wanted to make the point, I think, uh, you know about the role of the boards. I mean, just putting on my other hat, not the Forbes hat. The, one of the things that we've learned is that... You have that, to say what your other hat is. Uh, well, I thought Roshni... Anyway, uh, you know... Uh, we forgot. My yeah. association yeah. with a non-profit, which, uh, you know, whilst I'm a journalist and my background is in journalism, 20 years ago I got associated with a non-profit in the literacy space. Uh, which is called World Literacy of Canada. So it has roots in Canada, but all the programs are done in India. We work, again, like the Shiv Nader Foundation in Uttar Pradesh, because you know, if Uttar Pradesh was a separate country with a population of 200 million, it would be the fifth largest country on the planet. So uh, we focused on, uh, on that area, and we work in about 600 slums and communities in Uttar Pradesh, and we've set up Satyagyan as a sister organization to take women of after literacy to the next level of empowerment, which is income generation. Anyway, the point I'm trying to make is that, you know, for a small venture, as Ashish mentioned, I think the importance of uh, a board uh, cannot be underscored. You know, a board that is uh, coming from different walks of life, different backgrounds, and you know, is really committed, understands the purpose of the organization, the mission of the organization is completely in sync and committed, and ask those hard questions. So that's where the self-regulation comes in. And, uh, you know, my experience has been, and I've been on the advisory board and then as a founder director, that, you know, this kind of involvement is very critical at the earlier uh, stage. After you've reached a critical mass, you can talk about third party. But the board has to play that role uh, initially. And, you know, uh, for us, for example, in the last one year, I mean, we have a very small budget of under a million dollars. But, you know, in the last one year, we were able to impact 42,000 uh, women and children. So, you know, we, we do measure, but it's really the board that puts the checks and balances, you know, on the CEO of of, of a budding organization. So if, if I can just interject there, I mean, I think the, the board clearly plays a valuable role. But I think the metrics that we've been measuring in the not-for-profit sector, I mean, this question of just measuring how many lives you impact, I don't think is good enough. I think you really need to get down. If you're running a chain of schools and you're running 100 schools that impact low-income children, you need to talk first about some input metrics that we know are correlated with outcomes. For instance, student attendance, my benchmark is 90%, I achieved 88% through my network. Teacher attendance, my benchmark is 95%, I achieved 94, 95, give an explanation the way a corporate would. And then eventually measure learning outcomes as well. So, so you're saying attendance, not enrollment? Enrollment, I mean, it's, it's, you can show enrollment, but eventually it's attendance that matters. My only point is there are some 
input metrics, there's some output metrics, how come you've got to measure those. I think I've heard too many organizations talk about we impact X lives. What does that really mean? You know? Hachish, so, we have a very... No, no, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not uh, disparaging anything you've said. You, I, I don't want I'm to go into the, all those details. I mean, I'm just giving a broad brush. But we do have very detailed metrics out there. I'm saying the vast majority of organizations don't. That was the point I was making. Well, I would just like to make the point that all governments and all international organizations and all bilateral uh, organizations in development struggle with monitoring and evaluation, which is what we're talking about. So if anybody has the solution, please get up and tell me, because the World Bank doesn't have the solution. Uh, uh, and, and we're supposed to be pretty, pretty um, important in the sector. It is a real struggle. Uh, to, to, to get from lives touched or whatever it is to attribution and then to understand uh, the, the issues of causality, very important when, when you work in a space where government plays. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm with you. It, 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 it's important. So I said everybody should be accountable, big things about Im influence on pub public policy, but it doesn't mean that it should be a very aggressive uh, third-party monitoring coming. What I know from the World Bank trying to become more world uh, results oriented is that it is really difficult to think through what your programs actually do and that a bit of a safe space where um, you know a board would be good in a public in a private sector context but s some kind of internal body that, that sort of critiques and, and helps you get there could be very useful. Ultimately what you want in a sector is that everybody who plays in the sector agrees on a common framework, uh, which has been achieved in only one sector, which is HIV AIDS. There, there is an internationally agreed framework that everybody, literally everybody who plays in that space, has, 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 has one monitoring evaluation framework. That's the only way you can actually get there. Really difficult to do. Um, so, so I'd, li I'd like to just actually wear a different hat right now and, uh, you know, uh, while we do talk about, you know, a lot of matrix or, you know, disclosure, transparency, it, uh, you know, it's very important to understand the kind of people that we are dealing with. Mm. Because if you look at the not-for-profit space and you actually look at where the work is actually going on, some of these people, you know, probably do not even understand some of the very basics. So it's not due to a lack of wanting to adopt these practices or give this information, but it's only the, in, in my mind, the entire orientation of whether it is matrix or monitoring and evaluation or whether it is audit should, should be actually targeted and focused towards capacity building. Because you need to understand the kind of people who are actually doing the good work and, and, and we should not get away from, you know, uh, while, while I do come from the, you know, the, the, the consulting space myself and I'm a you know, very strong uh, believer of you know, transparency, governance, audit. It's, it's very important to understand that, it, you know, one needs to wear a different hat and one needs to tailor it in such a way that the system that you actually put in place is actually really, really effective. Would you say that this 2% in you know, CSR that the government has put, could some of it should be counted as CSR if they go into capacity building for these sorts of... Yeah, in fact, I am of a very, uh, uh, you know, uh, of, of, of a belief that as more and more uh, professionals enter the space, uh, I think the CSR rules will get the NGOs to be more and more in touch with the corporates. Not to say that the, you know, the, the, the corporates do not have any bad practices, but they, people in the corporate world are aware of processes, are aware of systems. And, and, and you, you, you cannot overlay one world on to another world in one go. But, if, 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 for example, there is a very, very high trend, uh, even in India, where a lot of the people, you know, once they reach a certain age, they get out of the for-profit side and actually want to work with some of the international, you know, not-for-profits and, uh, you know, in, in, in this space. And I think as more and more professionals uh, move into this sector, uh, you know, you will, you will kind of see a trickle-down effect, uh, somewhat in a way, uh, like a self-regulation or, or, or a good board, or, you know, or a voluntary so, so, so we are all agreed here, don't count me in that, right? I'm talking about the panelists here. We are all agreed that there should be financial transparency. There should be you know, tran transparency or at least assessments of what the impacts are. And there is some you know, discussion on whether we should start with all of these or get there in the state. 
And in the meantime, we could have internal boards and stuff like that. Now I want to open it up to the audience so that they can ask the panelists whatever they want. But before that, TSK no, wants I mean, to say something. I would just like to intervene because we have a very unique provision in our Income Tax Act, which is called Section 35 AC, where yeah, I mean they have de-bureaucratized the tax incentive for those who would like to have philanthropic activities for national economic and social development. It's headed by a retired Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. And they on the spot decide on, uh, I mean on the basis of an evaluation submitted to them, whether 100% tax concession should be given or not. Well, I was the first secretary of that committee. But the point is, when once it is granted, we have no mechanism to see whether the objectives have been realized or not. So the tax incentives, the government benefits, etc., need to be evaluated. And I think uh, time has come, because it's, it has been there for nearly 20 years now. Some evaluation of government incentives for charity need to be... So you mean uh, there should be periodic evaluation? Okay. Okay, any questions from the audience, please? Please uh, also say which panelist you want to... Uh, you want to uh, whom you want to respond, simply because we have no time, right? Not all the panelists are going to answer unless they want to. Yes, please. Uh, good evening. I'm Kate Kritika, pursuing my third year in electronics and communication uh, from Shivnadi University. Uh, my question is directed to Mr. T.S. Uh, T. Krishnamurti, sir. Uh, so you had mentioned that uh, there's a need for a third party organization to basically evaluate and rate the uh, various organizations involved in philanthropy. Uh, I just wanted to know what would be your suggestions for the parameters in which they should be evaluated, considering uh, all these organizations have different visions and missions. Thank well, you, sir. Uh, you know, in the case of a corporate sector, you have grading of various companies for depositors, for investors, etc. So you can think of an institution where professional evaluation will be done. And you give A plus, A or triple A, and grading can be given so that people will have some faith in the charitable work done by those institutions. Because we have to evolve some guidelines for this purpose. And um, I think time has come now because a lot of uh, corporate um, uh, institutions are going to contribute under the new law where 2% of the average profit of three years has to be given for corporate social responsibility. So I personally feel that uh, time has come for an institutional arrangement to evaluate the work, of, work done by the corporation, the charity sector. I was just uh, wanting to, I mean, why do we need a separate institution? I mean, we are constantly creating. Why can't someone like Crystal do that? Could be. I mean, I'm not saying that it should be a separate institution. All that I say is there is a need for an institutional mechanism to evaluate the charitable work done by these institutions. I, I, I think but the discussion is do we, you know, like the credit rating agencies, anybody wanting a loan has to get itself rated. But he's talking of self-regulation. So, you know, so, so no, self-regulation coupled with this, because this gives an incentive for people to r run that. Uh, yeah, but should it be a market-driven solution, or should the government make it obligatory? No, That's not, the question. No. You know, it's like, uh, for example, this executive I <coughs> talked about. I mean, if he could have an option of rated non-profits, I mean, that would bridge that, uh, you know, the trust gap. Uh, and some, you know, an organization like Crystal, if it's uh, doing rating of companies, why can't it, you know, See, apply the same There was, non a, there was a very no, interesting study. I may not study. agree with you, the same print guide may not be there, but there are no, different I guidelines that will be there. Yeah, yeah. I, no, no, I mean that, you know, they have the basic skills. It just has to be extended. Uh, there, there was a very interesting study done by somebody in the University of Chicago called LIST on why do people, or what triggers people to give money. Mm. Right, what sort of information is required? We are trying to do a similar study in India. Maybe we'll find out something as to what triggers and you know, the self-regulation and stuff. Mm. But yes, yes, please, at the back. Or in the middle, mm. rather. Then there is one at the back, two at the back. But you have to ask your questions pretty quick. Could, could, could somebody please give that person a mic? Please put up your hand so that, huh? Yes. Hello, sir. I'm uh, Dhruv Raj Kavi yes. from Shivrandar University. And my question is directed at Ashish Dhawan, sir. Uh, Subhashi, sir, asked you why would uh, charity organizations who are basically functioning with the help of a few donors uh, submit a report uh, that discloses everything to everyone? Uh, my basic point against it is that I feel that it is a win-win situation for them. They know that they're doing good work. 
and uh, if more people get to know this then i believe that they have a increase in the number of prospective donors that they can get um your thoughts on this sir yeah i think that's sort of the point i was making i was even saying in the instance of a single donor where you're not necessarily looking for additional donors there may be a certain obligation to disclose i think one important point that was made is that either in a very conscious manner or sometimes inadvertently you may be having an impact on policy the example given about the gates foundation work another could be i think this just general obligation on everybody to share what they are doing because why have multiple people reinvent the wheel you know so even if it's a single donor even if you don't want additional donors i understand that a lot of people want to be private they don't want to disclose etc but i think the the benefit of having people disclose or encouraging people to disclose uh, other than nazneen getting uh, what she wants i think would be this concept of sort of shared learning uh, that you could get out of this yes there was a hand at yeah uh, hi uh, i'm sanjay sanjay sinho i am from gates foundation oops and uh, <laughs> nothing wrong with it <laughs> it always happens <laughs> and i have seen you <laughs> uh, especially working on the public policy front so i really wanted to direct this comment on uh, ashish as well as other panelist one of the major issues with uh, philanthropic investments in india is uh, the poverty of baseline indicators available yeah. so literally many times the whole sort of uh, uh, monitoring process degenerates to a process where people start talking about number of people's life touched or something sort of thing which is unmeasurable i also want to make a comment that there are different disciplines which require different type of skill sets so where as a crystal or some of these settings or some of these uh, institutions might be able to do a financial rating process whereas philanthropy by itself is a impact oriented institution if you really start taking institutions like charity navigator or something like that who are working into this field for 20 to 30 years they still haven't been able to come up with matrix which are measuring impact and still looking only on to issue of financial uh, investment what is it affecting what is the overhead expenses etc etc so i personally really feel that sometimes in our discussion we start coming down to uh, lowest common minimum denominator uh, philanthropy by itself is a cutting edge thing in spite of whatever funding would be available through csr or something it would be very 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 minimalistic compared to the social development fund of the government so it's really important for us to keep on thinking about replication and scale up through some of those public policy issues thank you do you want to respond yeah i totally agree with you i think baseline is very difficult sanjay the point you were making but i think at least one should make an attempt at it so if you're doing an intervention even if you can't do a census based if you can't measure the learning outcome of every child in the program you run even if you can do a sample based uh you know even if it's a very simple instrument i would err on the side of doing that versus doing nothing so i agree with you it's very very difficult i also agree with your point around ratings being very very tricky with unlike the corporate sector where you're looking at profitability return on capital leverage ratios there are no simple easy metrics here uh you can check the box on a few things but it's much much harder so i would echo what you're saying but, but i i am the moderator moderator and as a moderator i should not speak much but uh, since you made this comment let me uh, make one quick point i think the problem is that we studied the way you know jpal studies it it's not that jpal is not doing the right job because they're really looking at the impact on a particular issue right but when kids go to school right they may not have learning outcomes but they may have a lot of other outcomes which we are not measuring these are all socio economic interventions they do have a lot of spillovers which usually a researcher does not look at right because the question is posed by the researcher before designing the research right yeah. now we did some of us did some work on the nrega right which is heavily criticized as it should be for all the corruption that is there but what we forget is that the money stays in the villages right 
it may it should have come to me it has gone to you but we are both still in the village yeah and you start spending it in the village that has an impact on me these spillovers were never taken into account when we were criticizing the nrg but it has had a huge impact in terms of everybody else's income on the time used by women right on how they spend their time and all of these things we don't study when you're looking at you know so what you were saying there with uh, you know policy related issues we should start looking at spillovers whereas the uh, impact evaluation approach tries to get out the spillovers no no i'm not advocating you were saying you know randomized control trials first of all are very expensive and may not be applicable in and, every situation yeah. and it's not, and but i'm saying at least issues. even something very simple is better than doing nothing at yes, all yes, absolutely right and being conscious so i agree with you learning outcome is not the only measure and so you may want to measure some other things and that you may use a simple survey as an instrument to do that but don't not do it no 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 yeah that is all agreed yes yes please uh, it's not a question actually uh, i'm from action aid my name is sandhya uh, the panel has uh, discussed on uh, the need for transparency and also uh, the impact assessment that is necessary Uh, but what it has not touched upon is accountability to the communities themselves i think ashish that did is, talk about it at the very beginning he did mention that there is an obligation since you are dealing with you know other people that you have to be able to be accountable to them we talked about grief. that yeah. is the cornerstone in fact of all philanthropy the, i don't i have not seen any hands from this side now i see one Hi, I am uh, Anurag Chaturvedi from Dasra. We are a foundation, and we raise philanthropic capital for other not-for-profits. Uh, I would invite comment from any of the panelists, but I'll draw some of the inputs that the gentleman from Grant Thornton had shared uh, earlier regarding the statistics. Uh, it's quite ironic. While there is need, and 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 I completely don't deny it, we lay emphasis on not-for-profits to have third-party evaluations, uh, uh, have statutory obligations, statutory compliances. The minute the overheads budget for any not-for-profit increases, uh, the not-for-profit ends up being unattractive for any philanthropist out there. So only one panelist is allowed to respond. Who will respond? um i'll take a shot at it uh, you know since i raised the question uh, in the first place uh, uh you know i i i still maintain that uh, you know it's an important matrix uh, you know to to measure and i uh, and it's important for you know every not for profit to actually make sure that their you know their uh, quantum of overheads are at least minimalistic or they they work out a way in which the allocation of those overheads to pro specific programs are are you know are uh, are are minimized uh, you know i'm sure sir uh, from the world uh, you know from the world bank's uh, side uh, you know all foreign donors when you know when they set about making their contracts they require you know a certain amount uh, you know of money also to come in from uh, you know either other donors or from the not for profits themselves and that's primarily to to sort of you know keep a certain uh, you know baseline governance to ensure that you know more and more of the not non uh, you know uh, uh, levels of overheads are not actually being loaded to the uh, to to the programmatic work your question has already been asked okay and anyone I else i just wanted yeah. to add to that you know uh, in terms of uh, you know forbes also publishes a 100 top charities uh, list every year and uh, we do we pick out a few all stars where we measure you know them as being more efficient and so on but uh, you know there was a comment like when this is posted online so somebody says oh my god the ceo of united way gets $600,000 so i don't know whether i want to donate uh, to united way anymore and you know be paying towards such a uh, heavy pay package so you know this this metric of pay actually also becomes a very uh, tricky point the other thing is transparency itself is uh, becoming important one of our uh, uh, franchises in the middle east which is forbes middle east publishes a list of uh, the top uh, you know the most transparent uh, charities in the middle east uh, they started doing that a couple of years ago and last year they had uh, something like 61 charities 
and the top two spots were occupied by Kuwait. Similarly, our uh, franchisee in China, Forbes China, when there was this big controversy in 2011 about you know one of the CEOs of a charity, uh, so-called affiliated with the Red Cross, uh, posted pictures of herself you know in a Maserati and so on. Uh, donations actually to nonprofits in China dropped by like something like 87 percent. So uh, Forbes China then started putting transparency as an important criteria in its annual list of top charities in China. So you know this whole uh, issue of transparency <coughs> is now beginning to resonate I think with with donors. Uh, quite so so I'd, I'd like, can I just benchmark that a little Very bit? Quickly, yeah. so, the UN charges 8% overhead if you ask it to implement a program for you. Okay, So that's our benchmark. Anybody who's more expensive than 8% we think is too expensive. We are, by the way, far cheaper, but it's a bit unfair because our volumes are higher. Uh, I don't think there's anything wrong with, uh, with, with saying I want that mi a minimum of 92 cents out of my dollar or 92 pesce out of my rupee to go to the goal that I'm paying for. There was a thing in the Netherlands recently where people went up to this mountain in, in, in France, the Alpe d'Huez, and raised money for cancer. And it turned out that 60% of the money went to overhead. This year, nobody is doing it because they don't think 40% is enough. Uh, I don't see anything wrong with that. In fact, I think people should be obliged to explain how many cents to the dollar go to charity. You're raising funds for charity. You're not raising funds for overhead. I mean, I, I don't see how anybody could have an argument with that. Uh, it, actually, if it's 60%, you're, you're cheating because you're literally raising funds for overhead. And that's why nobody's going up this mountain this year because they don't want to run for overhead. Somebody Very raised, quickly, sir. Yeah, somebody raised the issue of accountability. I thought that is a disturbing trend that is taking place in India now. We are able to employ outsourcing agencies and get donations, but the cost of getting such donations is about 60 to 65%. Is this really a charitable work? I'm, I'm not very convinced whether we should outsource getting donations and pay 65% of the donations because they have a tax incentive um, uh, for the entire donation, but 65% doesn't go for charity. So this is a very disturbing trend which is happening. I don't want to mention the names of the institution, but there are quite a number. So we, we have only about three or four minutes, and there are two questions I see. You coming first, right? Not three, only two. Now the can you pose your question in such a way that the answer is either a yes or a no? <laughs> <laughs> try, try, quickly. A, a mic, please, a mic, please. Thank you. Yeah, good evening. Uh, so my question is for Krishnamurti, sir. My name is Sundar from SNU. Um, so, uh, corporate social responsibility, the whole talk about it, um, I, <clears throat> I think, and I'm asking whether you uh, believe uh, yes or no, that uh, wouldn't corporate, <laughs> thank you. Uh, uh, wouldn't corporate or any business for that matter have an advantage if they were living in a society that is better off than whatever it is today? And if yes, how come government needs to regulate by calling for two percent or an X percent of CSR? Uh, you know, uh, putting that much of their profits into that thing. Why isn't, like you said, self-regulated? Why isn't self-driven? The it's question also has to be short. <laughs> yeah. No. I don't think I can answer it as yes or no. no the first question, yes or no, that if, yes. it, we, if we were a better society, would we have need for all of these things? Yeah, absolutely, because law doesn't really, you know, cannot enforce some of these things. But then, in a country where government has failed in governance area, perhaps it is desirable to channelize a part of the corporate profit for uh, charitable activity. Whether it is to be mandatorily done or whether it is to be given uh, voluntarily is a, you know, is a debatable point. But um, at least they have uh, put a condition that if it's an average of three years profits that can be used. So there is a reasonableness in that. Yes, yes or no? Yes, please. The last question. Just very quickly, I'm Dr. Niti Paul, and I'm the new Chief Medical Officer of the newly constituted healthcare business. Uh, ex trustee Diabetes UK, when that 2002 report came out, remember it very well. Uh, so very quickly, just to ask, there's a lot of CSR noise. There's a lot of noise around uh, structures. I run a kick, a community interest company in the UK. This is to roll. Uh, what do you think about different structures for running philanthropy in this country? Any quick answer? Yes. Since well, you're an outsider observing what we are up to. Well, 
you know, it would be nice if the CSR law would be would not be necessary. Now, you guys have decided it's necessary. You're a democracy, so collectively responsible, right? Um, once you've made it what it is, uh, I don't see how you cannot regulate it because you have to decide what qualifies. Uh, the volumes are going to influence public policy. I think it will have a profound change on the industry, if one can call this an industry. That's the consequence of the choice. I don't see a problem with that as long as the consequences of that choice are actually implemented. Otherwise, it could easily become a tax on enterprises with a lot of e evasive action of the kind described, uh, uh, and, 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 and not so good. Um, but I, I honestly can't argue against the choice, because with inequality and, and corporate wealth, there is a question as to uh, what does that mean for the rest of society. So I have, I have some sympathy. Remember, I come from the Netherlands, which is effectively not a philanthropic country, but more of a socialist country. So I kind of like the, the slant of forcing <coughs> companies if, to if, do good. If, if the Netherlands is socialistic, we are communistic, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, that, that's an interesting I, debate. <laughs> I think on that note, we should finish this uh, panel discussion. And I would like to thank the panelists, of course, as well as all of you for, keep, for allowing me to keep time. Thanks a lot. <laughs>